The Wonderful World of Dark Lords. Report 7. Flint's Archipelago. When my skiff landed on the island of Crescentia, I felt the same level of culture shock that visitors from the most sheltered and human-dominant domains must feel upon arriving in Martira Bay. Elves, dwarves, and gnomes seemed banal in comparison to the variety of residents in Flint's Archipelago. The small number of humans sat shoulder to shoulder with tabaxi, turtles, warforged. <laughs> A Lamordian laboratory could scarcely have had more variety. Crescentia was a rough port, and I felt a constant sense of looming danger, although that may have been a lingering reaction to my latest correspondence with my illustrious patron. I never told you about my brother, Yen said. I never told you anything about that night, and I have never told a living soul the details of how it ended. You seem to know more about me than anyone has any business knowing, and yet you have not seen fit to tell me as much as your actual name. Do you delve this deeply into the lives of everyone in your employ? Who have you been talking to, and why? I can think of a few ways and reasons you may have sought out this information, and I care for none of them. I am grateful for the tutelage you have given me, but if you have done this much research into my life, you know better than to test me where my family is concerned. At any rate... As mentioned, Crescentia had a sense of danger in the air, and I made sure that my hand never strayed too far from my purse as I searched for the ship that I had hired. People scuttled away like roaches in the light whenever the Warforged Constabulary appeared, and I overheard several muttered conversations about shipments of contraband, the sailing schedules of wealthy merchant ships from Port Ivy, and the details on the fortifications of nearby ports. I soon learned that, while Crescentia wore its criminality on its sleeve far more than other islands, piracy rotted in the hearts of Flint's archipelago, with greed, treachery, and a lust for plunder ensuring that if anyone presented an open hand, the other was concealing a dagger behind their back. Welcome to Wonderful World of Dark Lords. I'm Tom. I'm Rachel. And we're discussing how to convert Disney movies to Ravenloft Domains of Dread because nobody else would do it for us. <laughs> Along the way, we'll look at the Dark Lord, the domain itself, and some plot hooks and adaptation ideas to integrate the setting into your own campaign. Today's episode, Treasure Planet, sort of. <laughs> yeah, with this one, the Spelljammer books came Woo! out. And Tom started jonesing hard for Disney's adaptation of Spelljammer that they, uh, they came out with. <laughs> right. I was reading the books, I was really immersing myself in the world, I was thinking about all the possibilities, we're working on our podcast, there is an obvious overlap <laughs> between Spelljammer and our field of study, so we had thrown out some ideas for Treasure Planet, talked about it because it is a favorite of mine, but I was like, honey, can we please do Treasure Planet right now? <laughs> I don't want to wait. So here we are, and you know, we needed Yar. A little spoiler alert: the villain is just a villain. <laughs> Although you know he does get redeemed in the movie, but not in the source material. So we're not mm -hmm. you know being too weird here. And the reason that it's Treasure Planet, sort of, and not just Treasure Planet, is as we're kind of saying here with discussing it. Treasure Planet is not a Ravenloft movie. It's a Spelljammer movie. It, it is, is, yes. 100% Spelljammer. It is the Spelljammer movie yes. for, for many quarters. So it doesn't work tonally to have, you know, you're wandering around, you're sticking vampires in Barovia, you're, you know, going to the, the, the horrifying masked ball of the dark fairy tale and surviving all these poison intrigues in Borka, and now you're in space! Right, like, your, your campaign's never coming back from that. Like, no. once you give them a spaceship, <laughs> they're never going to be like, well, now time to go to Morden and do a gothic ghost story. And, like, where in Ravenloft is space? Right, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> how, does, how does that connect? <laughs> like, it subtly implies in the Ravenloft that Ravenloft is flat. So. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess all of the sky is the treasure planet. To right, yeah, it's everything else. And also, this means the moon is a space station. So, mm -hmm. just so you know. Even in our own framing fiction, D gets on a shuttle and goes to the moon. <laughs> and then she's going to come back to the planet and have another, like, regular movie. 
<laughs> next month. It, it doesn't really work. No. So, unless you're doing all of Ravenloft as a Spelljammer kind of thing, which, stay tuned for the yeah. bonus episode that we hope is coming out for this month. That is not a joke. We are hoping that we're going to yep. get a bonus episode coming out where we talk about Ravenloft and we Spelljammer. Will, we will be doing Treasure Planet as Treasure Planet. We are super excited about this. So, hopefully, we're, we're recording this far in advance, as usual, so we don't have it completed yet. We are really hoping this, it definitely is coming, and we are hoping that it's going to be a bonus episode coming out later this month. Treasure Planet, Borka Planet, Barovia Planet, yeah, stay tuned. I will try my darndest to get this, to get this going, <laughs> dear listener. But, back to this episode. If we're not doing that, then the thing to do is to take Treasure Planet and, like, put it on Earth. Tom, how do we do that? Well, I don't know, know right? Before. Like, <laughs> the serpent is eating its own tail, folks. The... <laughs> Treasure Planet is the adaptation of a nautical kind of 1700s golden age of piracy book. So we're just going back to that. And that fits absolutely. Mm -hmm. Tonally, period, aesthetics, 100% fits Ravenloft. You absolutely could go to Barovia. You could go to Daemonlu. You could go to Rishmalu. You could get on a big galleon and sail to an island with a bunch of pirates. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely, that fits. And we do have a little bit of, like, extra in in terms of Disney legacy content because the Disney did do a live-action adaptation of Treasure Island in 1950. So we even had kind of another connection with the Disney canon product overall. But that's not our podcast. We're not live-action movies. We're animated movies. We may branch out at some point, but right now we're animated movies. And so rather than doing... Treasure Island, Qua Treasure Island, we're taking Treasure Planet and putting it back in the ocean. So instead of... with us. (laughs) Instead of the Hispaniola, it's the legacy. More importantly, (laughs) instead of Captain What's-His-Face, who the heck even cares, we have my queen, Captain Amelia. (laughs) And she's a tabaxi. Rachel was like, hadn't really... I don't think I've even seen Treasure Planet before. She's like, oh, it's okay, I guess. that Captain Amelia shows up. Rachel's like, okay, I like this movie. (laughs) I will follow you anywhere. Oh, Captain, my Captain. <laughs> so, you know, we've got you know, Mr. Arrow's a Goliath. Uh, Long John Silver is going to have, you know, weird kind of steampunky, like, right, cybernetic right. parts. Since, you know, with, with Treasure Planet, it's not just a space version. It's a science fiction version of Treasure Island, but it could very easily be a fantasy version of Treasure Island. Yes. And Ravenloft is, you know, a fantasy horror D&D setting. So we're kind of taking that fantasy aspect and also, you know, the ridiculous coolness of having Dramelia there. <laughs> and I, I guess we'll put up with Dr. Doppler and more while we're at it if we must. And doing that instead. So this is going to be a change of pace from a little bit of a change of pace, but in a good way Mm -hmm. from the regular Ravenloft domain hopping. You might be doing with your PCs, even most of the ones we've come up with. They're very, Mm -hmm. other than our pilot, very human centric because it is trying to evoke the aesthetics of old horror movies, of Gothic horror novels. It's a little weird that you're doing Dracula. If there's like elves and kobolds and tabaxi hanging around, you you, kind of, clashes with the vibe a little bit but this is this crazy melting pot of like every potential race in D D in this ravenloft domain mm-hmm. and if you're doing the older material then it even is baked into the setting written in that it's mostly humans they are going to lose their minds if they come to you know mm-hmm. flint's archipelago and see about all these you know wild creatures going around. In 5e, you do have the option, maybe everywhere you go is a diverse, mm-hmm. and you know, you've got you've got Tabaxi and Goliaths and all these other kinds of amazing creatures wandering around. Your game. But for the stuff that we've been building so far, it's a big change of pace. Right. Because once again, this is much more crazy looking people than your average Disney movie. Mm-hmm. This is spider people and weird head guys and weird jelly people and just all sorts of bizarre things. And D&D can evoke that same kind of Star Wars cantina mm-hmm. scene cosmopolitanness very easily because it's got lizard folk and driders and all sorts of people you can be. And as Rachel mentioned, the kind of name, you know, obviously we're doing more than the island. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not just Treasure Island, the island. We want to do this whole kind of seafaring piracy setting, and we're calling it Flint's Archipelago. 
So we're, we're calling it Flint's Archipelago, and it is, you know, you can put it in the Sea of Sorrows or, like, you know, the Nocturnal Sea if you're doing the older stuff, or really any sea you want to put it in. If you want to put it in its own, like, distinctive sea that you made up, you can do that also. We do want to have it be a bunch of islands within this sea because much more than Treasure Island itself, a big component of this is the travel. That you're starting at the Benbow and making your way over to the island after you pick Long John Silver up. He, he has to be traveling trying to find this treasure, otherwise your Dark Lord is just a guy sitting on an island and then I guess your Dark Lord is Ben, I don't know. Many domains are spooky theme parks, mm -hmm. like Vampire Land, Werewolf Land, Frankenstein Land, Ghost Land. This is kind of spooky pirate land. Mm -hmm. And to have spooky pirate land, you need trade. Like, to have a setting where piracy mm. is a major component, you need trade. That's very true. So we want to have a, a not just, like, Treasure Island or even, like, Treasure Island and, like, one other place, like, like Bristol or a, a Crescentia in the Treasure Planet setting. But we want to have this whole sort of network of islands trading with each other, which leaves a lot of space for piracy in that setting. Mm -hmm. And speaking of a whole network of pirates and piracy, let's talk about the dark lord of this archipelago, this enormous archipelago of islands we are imagining, that is also planets in space, but on the ocean, <laughs> in our dark lord section. The Lord. I knew that my skiff was no match for the task of carrying me throughout the archipelago. I needed a crew with knowledge and experience, and I had been in touch with a sailor named John Silver who offered just that. He and his crew were on a journey to map some unexplored islands in the far corners of the realm. Silver assured me that so long as I pulled my weight, bringing me along would be no extra trouble for them and would allow me to take in the various islands along the journey. Silver ran what appeared to be a clean, respectable inn at the heart of Crescentia, and I found myself liking him immediately, although recent circumstances should have taught me to be more sparing with my trust. Several of his limbs had been replaced by bizarre bits and pieces from Warforged or other inorganic constructs, gifts from a Lamordian doctor that had saved his life after multiple mishaps at sea. I noticed some secret rooms in the inn that likely had a less savory purpose, but in Crescentia, a little smuggling or bootlegging seemed to go with the territory. His crew was a rough lot, more in line with what I was accustomed to seeing in Crescentia, but he was able to pull them back into line with a word or a look. At first. The longer our voyage went on, the more distracted Silver appeared, cutting his eyes to the corners of the rooms as if seeing something, speaking too loudly as though trying to drown out an interruption that I never made. At the time, I chalked it up to the stresses of the voyage. It is a testament to Silver's charisma that no other possibility occurred to me until it was almost too late. So, based on our past couple episodes, our Dark Lord's Captain Amelia, right? No, it's Jim. Oh, yeah, okay, yep. Actually, it's Morph. <laughs> the true <laughs> monster. God, I wish! Yeah, right, then you, can, then you can punch him. Condemn that guy to a hell of his own creation, better yet, a hell of my creation. I, mm, like, I have such sights to show him. Spicy hot take, they really, like, they really went all in on Morph. I and, Morph. Yeah, right, uh, if, you, if you don't have Morph fever then there are some stretches of this movie that are a bit tedious. I strongly dislike Dr. Doppler in no small parts because he's not worthy of my girlfriend, <laughs> but nothing compared yeah, to right. the burning hatred if I you, have for more. If, you, if the ship was crashing and you had one parachute. <laughs> I, I'd give it to Dr. Doppler. You know, he's, he means well, he's just annoying. Morph is just the worst. But we talked about this archipelago. We said we are going to actually have the villain be <laughs> the Dark Lord. So before we get into our villain, John Silver, our Dark Lord, let's make sure we understand our terms. Rachel, what is a Dark Lord? Well, a Dark Lord is an evil being who commits some kind of act of ultimate darkness and draws the attention of the Dark Powers, and they say, hello, friend, and they lock the Dark Lord into a domain which is a special hell of their own creation, much like the one I want to put Morph into. <laughs> When we talk about Dark Lords on this show, we have four qualities that make for a great Dark Lord, and we're going to go through and describe how those four qualities apply to Strahd von Zarovic, the, you know, ultimate of all Dark Lords. Right, like the, the archetype that yes. all the Dark Lords are riffing on. 
And then we can go in and apply that to Long John Silver and show how we're kind of trying to make him a Dark Lord in the Mold of Strahd. So the first quality that they have, as alluded to, is that act of ultimate darkness, that truly unforgivable thing that they do. Strahd's was killing his brother because he wanted his brother's fiance. Morphs is being the worst in the world. <laughs> Uh, I hate him. I, yeah. Anyway, I'm, I, I won't. I won't do all four qualities. So is it from morph cast. Yeah. <laughs> episode six. More reasons morph is terrible. <laughs> There's going to be a bonus episode. Like, <laughs> Rachel <laughs> yells about morph. <laughs> more options for the natives are never let. More options for killing morph slowly. <laughs> Our second element is what they call in the book The Torment, what we call, since this is a Disney podcast, they got what they wanted, they lost what they had. They have everything that they want except the most important thing. Strahd is all-powerful, he has eternal youth, but he doesn't have Tayana. The third element is that element of relatability or tragedy. They're not evil just for the sake of evil. They have something that makes us go, oh, gosh, yeah, I can see why you went bad. And in Strahd's case, it's that unrequited love is just the worst. And then our fourth element is that the domain in some way reflects the Dark Lord and their torment. Barovia, it is vampire land full of peasants and wolves and fog. And it's also incredibly boring and lonely for Strahd because by killing his brother, he basically said he wanted to be alone for the rest of his life. Or unlife, as the case may be. So to go into John Silver, and this is where we are even getting into some of our backstory for this character, there is the backstory we get from the movie, there is the backstory we get from the book. We are connecting a lot of that together and also adding a little bit of our own, and it's sort of on the ocean in space. Yeah, and I think with, with John Silver, this is the real reason you were really excited. Absolutely, to yes. Wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. Like I love space pirates. I don't need more of a reason than just it's got space pirates <laughs> with, with solar sailing ships shooting laser cannons at each other. But the reason people love Treasure Island, the reason there's been so many versions of it, it keeps coming back, I think, is that character, Mm -hmm. Long John Silver. And one of the reasons, other than the amazing designs of the spaceships, that this movie did make a real impression on people, some people including me, is the relationship between Jim and John Silver and the character of John Silver. And as soon as we were talking about doing Dark Lords, I was thinking, wow, he could be a great Dark Lord. Mm. If we tweak things a little bit, tweak the backstory, tweak the outcome, don't give him a happy ending, he's a great Dark Lord. So first we have that act of ultimate darkness. So we got we to add a little here. We have Captain Flint, who we're going to talk more about in a minute. But he is the greatest pirate in the archipelago. And he uh, Silver is his quartermaster. And in our story, Silver betrayed Flint and the ship to the Imperial Navy, and he led a mutiny of some of the crew and some of the other officers to try and take, basically, the map to Treasure Island in the sort of chaos of the fight. So, and this includes Billy Bones. And so this, you know, he's a pirate, he murders, he steals, but even for a pirate, this is a horrendous thing to do. This is the act of ultimate darkness. He betrayed his own ship. Not only he betrayed his own ship, he betrayed his own ship to the cops. Yeah, like, right, yeah. yeah. Mm. Like, most of the crew died, and these were people that served with him and fought with him and ate with him, and these people were his friends, and he betrayed them to the co- the space-slash-ocean cops to get this map and get this treasure. So like, like Gus Frank said, what kind of man does that? No man at all. Right, exactly. <laughs> so that is, even for a pirate in a world of pirates, that's going to be an act of ultimate darkness. So that is when that betrayal, that them escaping with the map, escaping the imperial attack on Flint's ship, that eventually left to Flint's death, that is our act of ultimate darkness. But this immediately, this being Ravenloft kind of segs into our torment, immediately... Billy Bones betrayed the betrayers. Because it's weird how that happens, right? If you have a group of betrayers, they have trust issues. So Billy Bones betrayed Silver. He ran off with the map alone. So Silver is now obsessed with finding Billy Bones, finding the map, finding the treasure. And this segues excellently into our torment. The got what they wanted, lost what they had. He cannot let go of the treasure. He cannot forget it or just go on and live his life he feels as a quote it's probably going to come up later <laughs> that he is he's earned it he has done all these horrible things he has betrayed friends he's betrayed shipmates he's betrayed the basic code of honor of a pirate 
and it's for this treasure. And part of that, this being the delicious, torturous Greek god punishment of Ravenloft, (laughs) the treasure will always slip through his fingers, Mm -hmm. that he will never get the treasure. Like in the book... There's this scene where they all, they go to the place, they go to X marks the spot, they dig, and there's like a coin. And it's because Ben has moved the treasure. Ben found the treasure and hid it in his cave. And so that's what we're going for. No matter what happens, it will always slip through his fingers. He will always almost have it, and then something will happen. And this connects with our version of Treasure Planet as well. Because part of Treasure Planet is this idea that Treasure Planet, the planet has this teleportation mechanism that Flint would use for his ships. And I'm imagining that Flint is actually a a rogue illithid, and his ship was actually a converted Nautilus ship. And Nautilus ships in Spelljammer, and I know this from Spelljammer, (laughs) have this teleportation ability. Yeah, so we actually, part of the reason why this feels so Spelljammer is because it was originally Spelljammer before it got sucked into Ravenloft. Right. Ship. So, so, which you know is is well in keeping with the fine tradition of Ravenloft. I mean, yeah, we right. had we had Sithicus to be the Kryn domain, mm-hmm. and even in the oh everybody is human days, it was Sithicus was all full of elves. Right. So this is for for anyone for anyone else who kind of is, is getting the cold <laughs> sweats of this, of this highly cosmopolitan domain. No, it's because it's a spelljammer domain, and that fits, and it's fine. So let's let's all let's all just like take deep breaths and go back to our guests' tears <laughs> and be you. calm. <laughs> The treasure here, like in the in the movie, it, it would it's this mountain of treasure in the mechanism. But here we're imagining this is Rachel's brilliant idea. It's actually on the ship. So it's on Treasure Island right now, but if Silver were to get to Treasure Island, find the ship, like something would trigger the teleporter. And then he would hear stories about it. He would chase down rumors of seeing this ship teleporting randomly around. He would get close, and the teleporter would trigger again. Like something's gonna happen that is going to make the treasure slip out of his fingers. And we also have that act of ultimate darkness of betraying his friends, his shipmates, and that he's literally, because, you know, let's literalize the metaphor, (laughs) haunted by their ghosts. He's haunted by the ghosts of the people he's betrayed, the people he's murdered, the people he's climbed over to get this treasure. And this has a wonderful snowballing effect of, the more he searches for the treasure, the more ghosts there are going to be. The more people he's going to end up betraying, killing, leading to their deaths. So his collection of ghosts, his, his chain of ghosts, is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But of course, that's going to be more motivation for, oh my gosh, I've done all this. Mm-hmm. All of that betrayal, all of that murder, all of that violence is in vain if I don't get the treasure. And part of why we wanted to do the ghosts was because... When we were thinking about the genres of horror that we wanted to do for Treasure Planet, a little bit of a spoiler for the genres of horror section, but we realized that this was a really fun, swashbuckling fantasy that kind of made pirates be their most horrible evil selves rather than (laughs) being Pirates of the Caribbean. But there wasn't a lot of, like, capital H horror to it. Right. So this is us trying to bring in, okay, we've got all this great fantasy, space fantasy stuff. We've got some great character stuff. Yeah. But let's bring in more explicit horror elements into the main story. Because we're going to talk a little bit later about how many wonderful horror things you can bring into a bunch of side stories here. But we didn't really have major horror tropes in the main story. And that that's not Ravenloft. <laughs> so we had to bring some of those in. And we're imagining just bringing it kind of all together. The ghosts get stronger when he gets close to the treasure. When he's just back at port, running his inn... He, like, he sees them. It's like a regular haunting. And maybe sometimes weeks will go by when they don't bother him. But if he gets a clue and starts going to the treasure, the ghosts get stronger and clearer and stronger and clearer and actually start being able to influence things. Mm-hmm. Because once again, this sort of literalizing the metaphor, he is going toward the treasure. He's kind of going back into that obsession. So the guilt over that obsession is getting stronger, is literally in this case, stronger and stronger and stronger. So one of the things, uh, another kind of aspect of his torment here that we see in both the movie and the book is that that everyone eventually turns on him. That you know, he's got the plan, everyone's following the plan, it's going to be great, but as they get closer to the treasure because he's recruited a bunch of pet radical ne'er-do-wells, they start getting greedy, they start getting short-sighted, they start spending all their time passed out drunk on rum. Mm-hmm. No matter how good his plan is, everything's going to fall apart. 
And we even see with Jim that, you know, he in the movie very much loves Jim. In the book, at least likes him. Mm -hmm. And doesn't want him to die. But Jim also finds out what's going on and turns on him. And in our imagining, part of that is because the ghosts are able to influence the people. In the movie, Stupid Morphin is Stupid Face right, yeah. was the one who led Jim into the, the barrel full of perps so that he could overhear what was going on. And in our imagining, it was a ghost. He like kind of heard something and followed it, and it was, it was a ghost. It was deliberately leading him there so that he would hear the kind of person that Silver really is. And with the the crew, we didn't see as much of the bickering and backstabbing other than Scroop in the movie. But in the book, everything completely fell apart and disintegrated because the pirates are chaotic evil and can't right, yeah. stick to a plan. Pirates don't traditionally have good long-term planning or self-control. Yeah. And, you know, again, part of this could be even if he recruited the best, most disciplined pilots somehow in the world, then the ghosts would be kind of whispering in their ears, mm -hmm. like dropping the suggestion, italicized as a spell, <laughs> that uh, Silver is going to turn on them and take all the treasure, which to be fair, he totally is. He probably would, yeah. And that may be kind of dropping the suggestion that, you know, uh, they've, they've been working really hard. They deserve to just relax and kind of take, mm -hmm. take a break. Sneak, sneak some extra rum. Yeah. Uh, yeah come on, this is like their third watch that they've pulled. No, no, no one's going to show up. They can sleep. It's fine. And so no matter what Silver does, these ghosts are going to be sabotaging him. They're going to be making his crew turn against him, making the people he actually cares about see the kind of person he is and turn against him. And this will lead to the creation of new ghosts. And mm -hmm. the cycle continues. So yeah, this is kind of a complicated torment. It's got kind of multiple parts, but really it all boils down to this. The essential, he's obsessed with this treasure. He will never have it. And every time he pursues it, everything will fall apart. Mm -hmm. And that's connected with our element of tragedy and relatability. And it's one of the reasons I love this character. I love this movie. I wanted to do this movie. And that is, I have written my notes here, sunk cost fallacy is a hell of a drug. That you get, like the Treasure Planet especially, really plays this up, the sort of sorrow and the regret, and I've made these terrible mistakes, but I have to do this because that justifies my mistakes. Like, if I mm. don't get this treasure, everything I've done is in vain, so I'm going to burn all my bridges. I am going to betray the people I'm starting to build relationships with. I'm going to turn my back on Jim because I need this treasure. Whereas in doing that, he's destroying any potential happiness. Like we're imagining, and this is jumping ahead a little bit, that Silver, taking something from the book, he owns an inn called the Spyglass Inn. And also he is the center, he is the leader of this kind of network of smuggling and fencing stolen goods. He's like really plugged into the underworld and doing very well for himself. And I think all of that is, you know, makes sense given what we know about Silver, the crew, and it even is in the planned but scrapped Treasure Planet 2, they were going to have him be a smuggler. And so he could have a good life. Like he could just be living his life, running a smuggling network and making pretty good money and living a comfortable life. But he can't. Mm -hmm. He can't let go of the treasure and he will burn all that down for a chance at the treasure. And that's tragedy and that's wonderful and that's being in a hell entirely of his own creation. Mm -hmm. Bing, bang, boom, dark work. <laughs> Just like I said, the, the moment where he has this connection with Jim, but he is willing to let that go, he's willing to burn that bridge to get the treasure that is really hits you if you watch at the right age as this very in deep characterization and also it's such a great dark lord moment. Oh, yeah. So our fourth one of the domain reflecting the personality, pirates exclamation point. It says, <laughs> it says in my notes that this is the aesthetically and narratively this is the domain of pirates. There's pirates, mm -hmm. there's islands, there's ports, there's pieces of eight, there's rum, there's cutlasses, it's everything you could want. And it all sort of radiating out from silver. And beyond that, we ha want this to be very much a domain of like betrayal and greed and paranoia that no one can trust anyone. Everyone turns on everyone. There's this great scene near the, where they, they've taken off on the, on the legacy and treasure planet. And Jim's starting to swab the deck because that's what a captain boy does. He swabs the deck and there's a group of the pirates and they're kind of talking quietly and they notice Jim 
is looking at them and they stop talking. And that's such a like kind of spine tingling moment to imagine of you're on this ship with these people and they they're up to something. And even in the book, they go into this a little bit more in terms of this very uncertain of who you can trust. Mm -hmm. So the whole that in the book, Silver actually is recruiting some of the crew members that are originally loyal to the Squire. Or there's actually the captain assumes Silver's going to be on their side. He's like, oh, some of these guys are pirates, but Silver's trustworthy. So this very much a setting of paranoia and betrayal and that all radiating out from our Dark Lord, John Silver. And his original sin of betrayal. Betrayal, yes. Betrayal is the keyword, the watchword <laughs> of this time. So we've talked about how this is kind of a more dynamic torment than a lot of them. It like has shifts as phases, and that, that torment is also connected with what we're imagining a lot of the horror of the domain. This domain of betrayal, this all kind of comes out of having John Silver as the domain lord. But as a domain lord, he also has certain special powers and connections to the archipelago. Yeah, so as a domain lord, he's got, you know, he's very charming and charismatic. And this is, again, in both the movie and the source material that, you know, as, as Tom mentioned, when they're talking about the people who were in the crew, everyone's like, oh, yeah, John Silver. He's yeah, yeah. Even like super Captain Small, it's so suspicious. He's he twigs the pirates right away. He doesn't trust them. But he's like, oh, but Silver, he's a good chap. And even you know, in the movie, Billy Bones says, beware the cyborg. And Jim sees Silver and is like feeling him out about Billy Bones. And in the book, he says, beware the, with, like, the one-legged man or the yeah, one-legged so. pirate or something like that. And Jim sees Silver and is kind of like, Ugh! and after five minutes of talking yeah, to him, yeah. he says, well, clearly it's not him. Like, he never even tries to actively feel him out. Yeah, Silver's yeah. just that charming. So, once again, you know, our go-to, we figure he does have, you know, charm and friendship that works at first and then wears off as you get closer to the treasure. I'm imagining being he has advantage on social roles mm -hmm. in most situations until he's getting close to the treasure. Yeah. And that's his charisma sort of fizzling out and maybe even shifting to full on disadvantage mm. on social roles. And you could arc the book like that. Yeah. Like he's getting close to the treasure, getting disadvantage on social stuff, people turning against him. But then once the treasure is sort of gone and they're moving away from it, he's getting that power again. And he's able to convince Jim to let him leave. Mm hmm. Yeah, and going with this thing with the ghosts who are kind of able to cast suggestion and everything, their power always supersedes his. Yes. Just if he's trying to charm you and make you think that he's the greatest guy in the world and the ghost comes and whispers in your ear that he's not, then if you fail that will save, then the ghost wins. And after that, Silver can't put his whammy on you anymore. All right, and this is kind of like Billy Bones saying, oh, beware the cyborg. It's sort of the Billy Bones is that one of those ghosts whispering and you're sort of having in your head that beware the cyborg. And then for a more mundane power that he has, he's got lots of criminal contacts, lots of goons. You know, he was on the crew of the most famous and successful pirate in the entire archipelago for whom the archipelago is named. And so that's going to give him all kinds of piratical contact. And then running the spyglass, you know, again, he's got this very successful black market that he's doing. So anytime somebody needs to smuggle something, fence something, whatever they need to do, someone's eventually going to hook them up with John Silver. In the write-up, I'm saying he has all the benefits of the criminal background. Mm, yeah. And then eventually that leads to everyone you know, owing him favors. He's, he's smuggled this for this guy. He's fenced this for that guy. Eventually, you've got all of these different contacts and goons and criminals all over the place who are owing him favors. And he is a canny guy. He's going to know how to call those in. Yeah, we see this in both the book and in Treasure Planet, the movie, that he's especially, but more so in the book, he hears about the map. Mm -hmm. He hears that this specific ship is the one that's going to be going after it. He gets himself hired as the cook. He like is able to hook up with the owner of the ship. He's able to charm him and get himself hired as the cook. And he's able to convince him to fire a bunch of the crew that's already there 
because Silver has these much more honest and trustworthy sailors that he can vouch for. And then because he's you know, he's this very slippery survivor type, he always manages to escape. He gets the lucky feet and the alert feet. He's kind of like Jack Sparrow in a lot yeah, of ways. Yeah. We're going to talk about this more later, but he is very much the, he's charming. He's always playing both sides against the middle. He always survives. But with the exception that Jack Sparrow, in some ways, he's going to come out on top. He does, like, sail off with his crew saying, bring me that horizon at the end of the Black Pearl. He's not running off alone, hated by everyone. Right, with a little skiff and, like, maybe some treasure. Yeah. He didn't come away with it with a ton of treasure, but he came away with it basically happy, and that is not John Silver. Like, he broke even. Yeah. John Silver was like, if Captain Jack Sparrow were chaotic, evil, and miserable. Yes, yes, which is a fun thing to think about. And then finally, we have, I'm really proud of this, Um, (laughs) we have his cyborgness. So as we mentioned, we're one of the ways we're asking this be treasure planet on the ocean and not just treasure island is that he is a cyborg. He doesn't just have a missing leg or a hook or a peg leg or whatever. He specifically has this Lamordian clockwork, like alchemically powered clockwork, prosthetic leg and arm and eye. And he can use a bonus action to activate certain of those features. One of the coolest things about John Silver in the movie is all his like crazy arm, prosthetic, eye glowing, heat vision things. Possibly installed by Victor Mordenheim herself. Possibly, yes. Your call. That's you're the GM. So with the eye, I have that he can use a bonus action to get dark vision or true seeing to sort of be like the X-ray, you know, heat vision. He can kind of see through illusions. And also he can use true strike, which was Rachel's idea. Because we have that thing where he actually does kind of zoom in and have a targeting system coming up on Jim. So he's got this kind of the equivalent of he can kind of have this targeting system. And then with the arm, he can use a bonus action that, to turn it into any weapon or tool he has proficiency in. So it can be a cutlass. It can be a pistol slash crossbow. It can be, but that's what you're doing. It can be cook's utensils. It can Mm -hmm. be like navigational tools. Like all of those things. It's a very simple rule write-up, but that does give you then all the like cool stuff he's doing with his prosthetic arm in uh, the movie. And then our last thing, closing the borders. You know, it's just, it's the sea. It's, Heavy mists, or you can't see your way out. There's tides. There's wind. There, there's a there's a gazillion ways to pull somebody back into the sea without making it super dramatic. Or like real life, this happens all the time mm-hmm. that people can't sail away from a place mm-hmm. for natural reasons, and he just does that. So this is the part where we do the role playing trait, and traditionally. One of the ways we've done this is uh, Rachel has come up with quotes because in the write-ups, that's always a series of quotes for the role-playing trait, the ideal, the bond, the flaw, we being the people we are. We don't want to make up quotes for these characters. Mm -hmm. We want to use quotes from the text, the sources, and find ones that reflect the role-playing trait, the ideal, the bond, and the flaw. And you may remember in our October episode, we mentioned that we had a poll for whether or not you wanted us to keep doing these or keep doing these in this format. And if the answer was no, sorry. Sorry. As mentioned, we record these way in advance. It's not October yet. Yep. <laughs> we, are, we are recording this in early September. Yeah. <laughs> Merry Christmas! <laughs> but we mentioned this one is really my cybernetic baby. baby. This <laughs> I really like this movie a lot and I wanted to do this. So I have the quotes here and I'm going to run them by by Rachel and we'll see what she thinks about our role playing trait, our ideal or bond or flaw. Now, obviously, dear listener, I'm going to do a pirate voice. <laughs> but I understand you can wear out a bit. So I'm not going to do too much of a pirate voice. <laughs> but are you going to do the pirate <clears throat> voice for the rest of the episode? That's the No. Okay. <laughs> Most important question our listeners are wondering. Yes, right once now. again, that's just, I get the, the, the balance of a bit is funny, but you have to know when to let it go. <laughs> so, ready? You ready? I'm, I'm ready. We haven't, done that. we haven't done this before. This is new. I haven't heard Tom's pirate voice. Mm, this or is, this or be... had to, you know... Pick off the quotes. It's not It's not Halloween yet if when mm-hmm. we're recording this. Is this going to be a Halloween costume? We don't know. I speaks nothing but me heart at all times. Mm. You just stick to the plan, you bug brain twit. Mm. Sometimes plans go astray. Ooh, good one. Didn't your pap ever teach you to pick your fights more carefully? That treasure is owed me by thunder. Ooh, good one. 
Disobey my orders again, like the stunt you pulled with Mr. Arrow, and so help me, you'll be joining him. And this, I mean, this is definitely, this name's going to be in it. Yeah. Now mark me, the lot of you. I care about one thing and one thing only. Flint's troll. That sounds like a bond. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still have that one. Th- thank you so much, John Silver, right, for, for expressing your Explaining that's the most important so thing in your life. Yes. The one thing and one thing only you care about. So, okay, cool. I'm just going to do, 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 write that down for the write up. This is, this is like I want to always be a little boy and have fun. It's yeah. Like, Thank you. Is. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, where was I? I was being piratical. We best be keeping a sharp eye on this one, eh, Morph? Wouldn't want him straying into things he shouldn't. And this is the other one I, I feel like is going to get play. You give up a few things chasing a dream. Ooh. And then just because I had to. You got the makings of greatness in you, but you got to take the helm and chart your own course. Stick to it, no matter the squalls. And then finally, never was much good at games. Always hated to lose. Ooh. Right? There's a lot of good. There's a lot of good stuff here. Yeah. S- Silver. It's nice. We do have a character that, unlike other people, like Maleficent, expresses his interiority a little bit. Mm-hmm. So what? It's balls in your court, honey. Oh right. Yeah. Oh gosh. One Here's down, a, three to go. Yeah. Mm. Uh. Let's I don't want to. I don't want to pre-color your judgment. Gosh. Um. Yeah. Right. Sorry. I, I went a little crazy. That treasure is owed me by thunder. I mm-hmm. feel like this definitely. Right. That feels like a flaw. That yeah, because that even it's... is his justification for what he did. Mm-hmm. And our whole thing is that is how he justifies everything bad he does, and also the heart of his torment is he keeps betraying people he keeps burning down his bridges because the treasure is owed to him even i love i love the line there it's owed it's owed to me yeah it's mm, yeah oh all right two down (laughs) two to go two down two to go let's see let me let me look back let me look back what you got here i really like to give up a lot of things chasing a dream but i don't know where it would go. It, it's um, a little more self-reflective. Like, that's his most self-reflective yeah. moment, and we're kind of doing not self-reflective yeah, silver. Yeah, yeah. And Never Was Much... I also, I also, I really love it's Never good, Was Much Good Against Those Hated. Like, I was... I was, I was that, that would be really good for the flaw, but Treasure is mm. Made by Thunder is just... Can I too give you a... Like, yeah, this so is what I, was, I do that all the time when it's me, so... Right, yes. I'm gonna say, like, like we can cut out the making of greatness in you, but the role-playing trait, I would probably pick you got to take the helm and chart your own course, stick to it, no matter the squalls. Mm. They like this idea of that his tenacity and his... Would that be the trait or the ideal? I could do either one. Because I feel like the trait, we need something that has more to do with like the treachery and the trickery. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, but, but that could be good. That's a good ideal, yeah. yeah. So I'm cool with that as the idea. Yeah. Like cutting a little bit, him being nice to Jim. The tenacity and the... Re- that, that's like the positive spin of the obsession is yes. you chart your own course... You stick to it no matter the squalls. Mm-hmm. And that's what he's done. He's charted his own course to the treasure. No matter what happens, he's going to stick to it. Mm-hmm. So, okay, we just need to find a quote, a role-playing trait that sums up this character. Never was much good at games, always hated to lose. Is a that's one. a good one. That's um, a good one, yeah. Speaks of something moving hard at all times is a lie, so that's right, not yeah. that's a good for a trait. Um, Maybe the just stick to the plan, you bug bang twit, the sort of... That mm. kind of is that he's the leader, he's yeah. the commander, but he's a bully. He's a bully, but he is going to be like dealing with these idiots. Yeah, he he does he does rule through fear and intimidation, and he's the leader, and he is the planner and the strategist, right. and he's ha- yeah, yeah. Okay, you yeah. cool with that? I'm cool with that. You'll just stick to the plan, I, you bugbane twit. I hate to lose and ever was my That's so again. good. Oh, I, I, hate love that that one. I hate oh, to lose that one. I hate to lose. I hate to lose. That's my favorite scene in the entire movie. That's a really good scene. When the when the he 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 comes down and he sees Jim down there and like you just get to watch a play he's like just surprised to see him and then it sinks in as he realizes what seeing him means that he's overheard all the plans for the mutiny and then like they're kind of dancing around each other mm-hmm. pretending that they don't both know that Jim heard that he was planning the mutiny. That's really it's good. such a good scene. It's really good. Best scene in the whole movie. I, I, oh, I hate to lose that quote. That's but but I do I do think it, it would be a flaw and it's not as good a flaw as that treasure is owed to me by Tucker. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so yeah, cool. Sounds good. So so for our role playing trade, just for the, if you got lost in the in the in the, <laughs> in the, in the piratical voices, then yar, yar by Tucker. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Or if you're going for Robert Louis Stevenson, by the powers, which is a little too on the nose for him. Yeah, I'd but say. great, right? But yes. Then our role playing trait, we're doing the stick to the plan, you bug brain. Stick to the plan, you bug brain, <laughs> twit. twit. <laughs> because that expresses a lot more of this is who Silver is, how he relates to other people, how you would role play John's, even kind of being the planner and the manipulator. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we've kind of we've talked about Silver and we've talked about how he's going after this treasure and how that's the only thing he cares about. And he's searching through the entire archipelago for this treasure. So let's talk about that archipelago in the land. The land. While Crescentia was more rough and tumble than most ports, piracy seemed to be the rule of the archipelago rather than the exception, and not only for those who proudly declared themselves to be pirates. Tolls and fines varied tremendously from one point to another, and I suspected that the difference went straight into the pocket of the toll-taker. If I'd caught a whiff of perfume, I would have thought that Silver had taken me to Borka by mistake. Even the archipelago's common name reflects its larcenous nature. While its technical name is the Imperium, everyone knows that its true master was Captain Flint, a legendary and bloodthirsty pirate who left the island's residents quivering in terror during his reign on the seas. Flint vanished some time ago, taking his treasure with him, and the residents of the archipelago have whiled away many an evening swapping theories about its ultimate destination. Our voyage took us past islands with bustling ports and with only a few shepherding villages, with lush jungles and with nothing but a single lighthouse overlooking barren rock. The silhouettes of great marine beasts swam beneath the waters, massive sharks, dragon turtles, even something that could only have been a kraken. The mood of the crew became more tense the farther west we traveled, and while Silver continued to claim that they were on a simple mapping expedition, none of them seemed to know how to use cartographer's tools. At one point, I was awakened in the night by an unfamiliar voice crying for help. When I followed it, I found several members of the crew discussing in low tones whether I could be trusted, saying that Silver couldn't let me have a share in what was theirs by right. The source of the voice was nowhere to be seen. I resolved from then on to sleep lightly, and with my spell components close at hand. So, our domain, as mentioned, is Flint's Archipelago. It's hundreds of islands. They're all you know, various places that your your ships can go to. Some are little, like, cartoon desert islands with, like, a little mountain of sand <laughs> and a coconut tree. Some are Cuba mm-hmm. or Florida. They're as big. They're enormous. They have interiors. They have multiple cities. They have massive farms, agricultural products. You've got that whole range of the kind of classic Caribbean. Teeny, tiny little specks of nothing are islands. Jamaica's an island. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of variance there. You've got hundreds of islands going through the archipelago, and it's, you know, again, a center of trade. It can be a place where other domains go through. You can, you can say, if you want, that a lot of times the mists kind of lead you through the archipelago on your way to other domains, and that gives excellent opportunities for piracy and kind of encapsulates that idea of the ocean being a place you had to go in order to be trading between places. If you do have a unified core and a unified geography for all of Ravenloft, then you might put the archipelago and the sea surrounding it between a bunch of the domains. If you just have the idea of the floating mist islands that don't connect in any particular way, then again, you can have it be that a lot of times the mist just so happen to lead you through this particular place, especially if you don't have a mist talisman. A bunch of the domains in 5e, the the mist islands, have oceans, Mm -hmm. and all of them have rivers Mm -hmm. that just go off the map. And we're kind of imagining the archipelago is the middle, Mm -hmm. is if you just got in that ocean and sailed and the Dark Lord had not closed the borders, you end up in the archipelago. Or if you get in that river and you sail off the map, you end up in the archipelago. Mm -hmm. And the great thing, we're going to talk about this more in Adventure Hooks, but the great thing with it being this archipelago full of all kinds of islands is that you can have pretty much any pirate adventures you want. And we are going to be talking about some of the specific places that come up in Treasure Planet, because that's what we're doing here. But if you want to do this very nautical, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean slash Salt Marsh slash On Stranger Tides style. (laughs) Woo, Tim Powers! We love you, Tim Powers! 
style domain, then this is the way to do it. This gives you an opportunity to do all kinds of like wild nautical adventures. We're not fleshing out, you know, again, there are hundreds of islands. We're fleshing out like three of them. Yeah. So do what you want. If you check the write up that we're going to put on DMs Guild for free, writing all this up in the Van Rick Guide always. format, as always, I'm going to give you a bunch of places, islands with some plot hooks. I, I'm not going to just sit here and read that. <laughs> We're just going to be focusing in the podcast on the ones in Treasure Planet. But it's there if you want. Yeah. The big thing we're trying to make, have there be the unified theme of greed and betrayal to make it clear that this is, you know, the one domain. Because with the Sea of Sorrows, like, the sea is a domain, but then the individual islands within the sea are their own domains with their own themes. So, like, Dominia with the asylum and everything, that doesn't tie into Peter Van Rees' torment in any way. It's its own island with its own theme and its own domain lord and all that stuff. Whereas here, since we're imagining it all being this one domain under John Silver's purview, having that theme of greed and betrayal is really going to be the unifying theme that brings all of the islands of the archipelago plus the ocean connecting them together. And so part of this is we're going to have this government because you can have piracy without a government. Mm -hmm. You And the government needs to be weak. I'm not going to launch the whole thing about the conditions of piracy, but as you can imagine, the weaker the central government is the more you get piracy. And the government we do have set up in Treasure Planet is called the Imperium. And this is developed more in the computer game. <laughs> and But it's called the Imperium, and you do have a government, right? Uh, Amelia, Captain Amelia, talks about fighting in a battle. She was in the Navy. They have a flag that's clearly like a, a naval, a national flag, that the pirates strike the flag and put up the cool, awesome Space Jolly Roger. So cool. It's really Jim. good. Jim joins the Imperium at right, the end. Right, he has the, like, he's clearly in, like, a uniform at the end. Apparently the course he wanted to chart was letting the Imperium chart his course, but hey, maybe he wanted to be lawful good. We don't know. You know, sometimes people join the army to get their lives together. <laughs> so, we're imagining we have this archipelago, and there is a central government, and that government's called the Imperium. It's a monarchy. In the book, this isn't a thing, it's Britain. But we do need to come up with our own setting. Yeah, Britain's an imperial. But yeah, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they don't need to talk about what the right, government right. is. Because it's just the world. So we have this imperium. And in order to allow for piracy to flourish, we are imagining it as a very corrupt and insular monarchy. That it is technically supposed to be providing the government for all the archipelago. But a lot of the nobles, a lot of the lords, a lot of the powerful people are just focused on their political squabbling and their greed and their selfishness. And that is our extending from silver, extending from greed and corruption and betrayal. Mm -hmm. So this is this very weak government, which has a lot of power, but is so focused on political squabbling and corruption that you have a lot of space for piracy. Silver has a lot of friends in the government, doesn't he? He, he, he totally yeah. has a couple of people in the government who are directly on his payroll. Definitely does, yes. A couple <laughs> of customs people. Yeah. And that generally, like, captains like Amelia, who are honest and stalwart and believers in the system, are very rare. That generally, the higher up you go in the society, the more kind of corrupt you have to be just to continue rising. Because mm -hmm. that's how things work and the high levels. The good and noble ones who are able to hold on to their ideals but are, you know, low-ranking enough to be able to go and have autonomy and do their own thing are PCs. Exactly. Or even you could have this with Amelia that she was a captain, she was successful, she was this, like, apparently hero of this battle... But now she's a private contractor. Like, she's not in the Navy mm -hmm. anymore. So there's something there that we can pull out as a, a kind of a society that burns up idealists. Mm -hmm. Or that if you're an idealist, you kind of have to walk away. You can't rise very high in this system. <laughs> this treasure planet meets the wire. <laughs> yeah, right? And so I'm imagining it's kind of a 1700s Britain. So there's like this veneer of respectability, but that a lot of the nobles are very corrupt and a lot of the ostensibly respectable people have kind of a hand in dirty money. That's a really cool parallel and reflection of John Silver also that, he, you know, again, everyone trusts him. Everyone thinks he's great. Mm -hmm. He looks like this respectable cook running the spy glasses. It's a respectable establishment, but underneath it is this hub of smuggling. So that actually is also a, a great reflection of the Dark Lord there that I, I hadn't thought of. That, well, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I like this movie and thought about it a lot. <laughs> I didn't realize you had done that intentionally, but good job. So... 
we don't need to go into a ton of detail about the Imperium. If you just sort of imagine that, you know, sort of Regency, Jane Austen era, Britain, everything super corrupt and terrible. <laughs> Like, you can do that. You can imagine that. You can make that setting. You can role-play those those snobbish yet corrupt customs officers. Mm -hmm. So that's our, our kind of governing structure. And we have a couple of specific places that we see in the movie and that we are, are going to mention in the podcast. And first, we have Montresor, which is where Jim is from. I'm not totally sure why they named it Montresor. If you know, please like, subscribe, leave a comment. <laughs> but that this is a mining. It's an island that has a lot of mine, a lot of mineral resources to take some stuff from the books. It has a lot of like bays and coves. There's a lot of smuggling. You've got the Benbow Inn. And it's kind of near this very lonely cove. So a lot of kind of criminal traffic there on some of the major roads. And this is isolated from authority. This is kind of an outskirts. This is the hinterlands. But because it's this productive mining center, it does have a major port. So what do you get if you have in the hinterlands, but a big port? You got smuggling, you got piracy, you got stolen goods, and that's what we have with Crescentia. And so, presumably, since this Montresor, lots of stolen Amontillado. Lots of stolen Amontillado. Like, if, if you know why they call the yeah, Montresor, okay, please tell that's, us. Uh, that's the seal of the Montresor. I do not get it. Like Crescentia, <laughs> it's a crescent moon. It's, it's yeah. awesome. It's well, amazing. It's and, so good. You know, not calling it the legacy instead of the Hispaniola, like it's there's no like Spain. It makes right. That, yeah. Like why is it not Bristol? That there's no reason for it not to be Bristol. Right, Bristol's yeah. just yeah. Anyway, but yeah. we're doing Treasure Planet, so it's Montresor. It's Montresor. And then you have Montresor is the island. And part of that island is this large crescent-shaped port called Crescentia. And this is a, a very large port. It is very productive. It's very busy. You know, we have that kind of Star Wars cantina moment when Jim's getting off. And there's just this huge hustle and bustle and rich people and poor people and ships taking off and traders. So it's this very busy major port. And we are taking from the books that Silver owns the Spyglass in. But that even though it's owned by Silver, and I love this detail from the books. It's very clean. It's very orderly. It actually is a very nice establishment. Silver's so smart. He's and so smart. And he's so smart. professional. He's yes. so like, cool-headed. Like, one of one of the things I loved in the books was there was Flint's treasure that they were looking for, but everyone had gotten a decent payout from being in Flint's crew. Like, they did have money that they got just from being pirates on Flint's crew, and most of the crew had squandered it and was just living on the streets by this point. But Silver was smart and he knew how to invest it and he invested it in getting this in and running this successful yeah. business like he's a smart guy he talks about how he's a lot of it in the bank mm -hmm. like he's got a bank account he's got a saving yeah. account getting interest on his on his pirate loot yeah and that's kind of the torment of silver <laughs> is you are the kind of person who would invest in real estate and have a savings account but all of your subordinates are the kind of people who are going to blow it in a weekend of gambling and drinking. Mm -hmm. And you've got to, like, wrangle these idiots <laughs> and try and, like, beat some impulse control into their heads to do anything. And you've always got to deal with that these are idiots who are just looking for the nearest bottle of rum or the nearest spaceport floozy. <laughs> who is not Captain Who is not Captain Amelia. Quick mention, we have a planet, or we have an island called Port Ivy. That is the Naval Academy and also the major fleet base. That is where Jim, in the uniform at the end, he is going to an academy at a planet, and treasure planet, called Port Ivy. Mm. And then finally, we have Treasure Island. This is Flint's secret base. As I said, we're not imagining, like, the island having the teleporting mechanism, but Flint's ship having the teleporting mechanism. This is, like, the secret base of the ship. So the map will lead you to Treasure Island... It will guide you to Flint's kind of secret base on the island, but that the ship has the teleporting mechanism and it will activate when Silver gets too close to it. And the nice thing is we can have this, like the base is sort of built around the ship and we can have it be a load bearing ship. Yes. So that when it teleports away, we can have that fiery climax where like mm -hmm. the island is falling apart or yeah. like it teleports away and that like triggers a volcano to erupt because mm -hmm. you want that awesome set piece ending and we can still have that with the ship teleporting away. Yeah. And you can set up the ship however you want to give you whatever kind of load bearing climax you want. Is it in a volcano? Is it in a place that's going to trigger an earthquake? Is it like under the sea and they're, suddenly they're going to be in the middle of the ocean and the water's flooding and whatever the you The island's going to sink. Yeah. Like, GM, yeah. So 
you do still get, once again, kind of this is not Treasure Island, where the island is just still there and still has treasure on it. Mm-hmm. This is Treasure Planet Island, where the whole thing's going to explode at the yes. end, one way or another. So we've got some cool places. We've got a port. We've got an island that will explode when you get too close <laughs> to it. We've got a load-bearing pirate ship that's also a, a lifted Nautilus ship. But how do you bring your players into those things to make the island explode? Rachel, what do you do with it? Dread Possibilities On the fifth day of our voyage, a cry of excitement went up from the crew. At the beginning of the journey, I would have thought that we had caught sight of our first uncharted island. Now, I could only hope it would lead to an opportunity for escape. As the crew prepared to land, Silver approached me and said that he'd been watching me during the voyage, that I was a dab hand by Thunder, and that he wanted me to help him with their true goal, finding Flint's treasure. He looked perturbed when I laughed in relief. A treasure hunt? Was there any more mundane reason for an adventuring crew to set out on a journey? Let my patron note that if the crew had been honest with me from the beginning, I may have signed on to what I believed to be a jolly adventure and accompanied them to the island with no fears. Remembering their lies and plotting, however, I could not make myself believe that they would share the treasure once it was found, or that they would believe that I had no interest in it. Fewer surviving treasure hunters meant a larger share for those who lived. No sooner had I thought this than I spotted the spectral figure of a man in pirate garb over Silver's shoulder, a hole in his chest, shaking his head at me in warning. I knew a refusal would be more than my life was worth, so I immediately agreed to join Silver on his treasure hunt. Later, when the crew was in a rum-soaked stupor, I stole a jolly boat and rowed as quickly as possible toward the mists. I want adventure in the Great Wide Somewhere. I want it more than I can tell. So, if you want your adventure in the Great Wide Somewhere to be in Flint's Archipelago, let's talk about why you come other than the mists come and sweep you away and drop you in Flint's Archipelago, which is always a time-honored way. GM saw a pirate movie yep. and is just <laughs> feeling piratical. Talk like a pirate day is coming up and the GM wants to honor it. Yar. So, one way to do it is that you're, you know, you're somehow working on a ship, you're traveling from place to place, and you're doing it by boat. You know, Maybe you have chartered a ship to go from one of the uh, domains that borders an ocean to another domain that borders an ocean. And you want to do kind of like what they're doing with Sea of Sorrows in 5th edition, where any body of water in Ravenloft can end up in the Sea of Sorrows. Maybe it can also end up in Flint's Archipelago. Uh, one possibility might be that Flint's Trove contains some kind of specific treasure that you're looking for. Right. We did this a bit with Captain Hook and going after Captain Hook and Jolly Roger. Your players need a magical MacGuffin. They trace the provenance of the MacGuffin. It was on a ship. The ship was raided by Flint. Mm-hmm. So to find this particular Gigaw, they need to find Flint's Trove. And so basically, in that case, you're being Jim Hawkins. He found the treasure map. He is looking for it. You can have your PCs stumble across the treasure map. Maybe even Billy Bones finds them and, you know, bestows it upon them as he's dying with his little turtle self. (laughs) And uh, in some way, you have a clue to the trove and you're looking for it. And either you are just straight up doing Treasure Planet with, you know, Silver being on your crew and everything, or you're going to be, you know, running afoul of Silver as he's also looking for the treasure and you're going to have big old ship-to-ship combat with cannons and yarns. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> It'll, Either way, it's going to be cool. It's as simple as I remember, I think it was Bleak House and it's Dominia where you start mm-hmm. the, the island. Rachel ran this for me and some friends in college. And you're we were on a ship. We were going somewhere totally unrelated and a storm happened and we ended up there. And it's mm-hmm. as simple as your players go on a ship, there's a storm, the mist rolls up, and there's pirates. And even in this, in Bleak House, it's, uh, there's a storm and you're shipwrecked. And as you're floating in the ocean, then this ship from Dominia comes and picks you up and takes you back to Dominia. So you could have it be that, you know, yeah, you're, you're shipwrecked, you're floating in the waves, and then this wonderful, helpful ship with this right. fantastic, you know, cook on board, who's just <laughs> the friendliest guy in the world, comes and picks you up. And if you want to do full treasure island that's a planet, <laughs> it could be the legacy. That mm-hmm. like that you're you're kind of ten minutes into the movie, but they find this shipwrecked crew and they bring you on, and you get pulled into this whole back and forth of the mutineers versus the sort of legitimate 
crew and officers. Mm -hmm. But there are also a ton of other plot hooks in this domain. The great thing is, this is one where you don't just have to do the movie. There's a bunch of other things you could do. You know, there's a ton of pirate stuff here. Any kind of story you want with the buccaneers and buried treasure and, you know, ghosts haunting lighthouses yeah, and just yeah. any of your any of your spooky nautical stuff you could do it in the sea of sorrows or you could do it here just as easily the core story is treasure island but it's not the only story that you can do and the nice thing is you can bring in long john silver because we're imagining him as this like set this like crime war basically mm-hmm. this He's the job of the hud of right exactly <laughs> like his the spyglass in is this kind of center of a spider web of smuggling, of fencing, stolen goods, not sword fighting, but there are sword fights, of any kind of like oh, information, like he knows what's going on, he's the big information broker, he wants secrets, he's looking for the map. You can have him as a recurring NPC without having to like engage with the Treasure Island story, mm-hmm. but having to be the whole looking for, for Flint's trove. It can just be you keep tangling with guys working for Silver, or Silver is giving you information in exchange for you going checking things out for him. Mm-hmm. Kind of a either a, a villain or an ally or a friendly rival or a ambiguous source of information, or all of the above. And the great thing with that is that you can eventually build to doing the Treasure Island story as sort of a climax of your Flint's Archipelago adventure. You can have Silver as this, you know, friendly NPC or rival or whatever, and then at the end of this, all, all of your various nautical adventures... You owe him a bunch of favors, and he calls them all in, asking you to help him out on this mission that he has. Or, you know, he kidnaps you, your your rivals, and he kidnaps you, and it's all, I've I've, I've, I've never liked you, but I know that you have gumption, so you can (laughs) help me with this, or you can walk the plank. It is your choice, lads. You get to do the voice. Oh, yeah. We we should do it just, just just for getting to be all piratical if you're the GM. Or even, you know, if, if he's if he's their bestest buddy, if they're totally charmed by him, you're probably not, if you're giving him the name Long John Silver, you right, probably, right. you know, that would be if you're trying to spring this on a surprise, yeah. But if they think he's just this really cool, charming, you know, Hondo Onaka guy who's their, who's their buddy. Watch Star Wars Rebels if you didn't yeah, get the Hondo really Onaka reference, it's great. Or Clone Wars. Uh, but, but Rebels. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know he was also... He's introducing Clone Wars. Oh, okay, all right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Rebels girl. Uh, bingo, by the way. Um, uh-huh. Star, Star Wars hasn't come up in a while, but here we are. Anyway, so... If, you know, th- he's just, like, this cool, fun, uh, like, ne'er-do-well NPC, maybe they like him enough that he doesn't even need to call in favors. He just says, hey, I'm, I'm going on this this quest. I'm, look- I'm, I'm looking for the treasure. I'm going on a hunt. And they, they go along and then find out things are not so great. Yeah, I would love to run this. Of They mm-hmm. go in to the legacy working for Silver. Like, your PCs are, like, weird head lady <laughs> with little chicken arms <laughs> and... <laughs> like guy with with a face in his torso and the big blobby dude and like that cell there's a little cell of those mutineers that are your pcs and they go into the situation just like silver has a job for them he wants to take the ship it's piratical stuff but then like you meet jim you meet amelia you meet dr doppel you kind of get that this is a really shady thing but like you're loyal to silver and just that that'd be a really fun are we the baddies kind of <laughs> of play to do? So I think the best adventure is, as Rachel said, it's something that leads to doing the Treasure Island story. But the great thing is, if you're just like, this is my pirate zone and there's Long John Silver, he works just as like a kind of famous canon NPC. Mm-hmm. It's like, I think I heard they're going to have Long John Silver be in Pirates of the Caribbean 6 or 7 or something oh, like good heavens, of course and like maybe not maybe I just somebody said something and I misinterpreted it but like you could believe it right mm-hmm, if I like like mm-hmm. like I just said that to Rachel and Rachel you were like yeah checks out right <laughs> because that's a pirate people have heard of mm-hmm. like it's totally plausible that they if they were doing Pirates of the Caribbean 6 that they'd have Long John Silver as the big villain because mm-hmm. he's a famous pirate yeah yeah and same thing with using him for your players if he's just being like the fence that mm-hmm. they sell their stolen goods to. Or the guy who can give them leads on cargoes that are good to raid. If your players aren't super familiar with the book and whatnot, because in the book, I think I mentioned this earlier, but Long John Silver is 
unquestionably chaotic evil in the book. He's just he's a terrible person in the book. If they haven't read it in a while, if it's more kind of some of the, the movie adaptations that soften him a bit, then you might even be able to bamboozle the players even calling him Long John Silver if yeah, you want yeah. to have him be really villainous, so then they might not realize exactly how bad he is. Like, they're going to assume he's going to be good at the end, especially if they're mainly familiar with Treasure Planet. Mm -hmm. But no, you're not Jim Hawkins. He doesn't like you. He's going to (laughs) murder you to drop of a hat if you stand between him and his treasure. (laughs) And that is a good segue into our Dread Possibility section. Uh, We have got uh, our first aging down, aging up. And obviously, one of the sliders here is the violence. Mm-hmm. Do you have the more goofy cartoon violence, where it's you fire guns, sort of G.I. Joe, everyone fires their lasers, and then they fall down, they jump out of the ship as it explodes. You know, the main violence you have is someone shoots the lamp, and it falls off the ceiling and hits somebody and knocks them out. Or do you have cutlasses and musket balls and people getting stabbed left and right? Or is there going to be kind of the Disney death falling to their death like we see in Treasure Planet? Or is even that going to be too much? You know, we had Arrow and Scroop kind of go flying off into space. They mm-hmm. can have people, you know, fall off and drown. Or not. It well, all depends on where you're putting the aging up, aging down slider. And the other slider is going to be Silver. Yes. That how good a person is he? How murderous is he? How cold is he? In terms of the story, Treasure Island, Rachel mentioned there are kind of different reads on his relationship with Jim. There's always the idea that he likes Jim, but with Treasure Planet, they do all the bonding before there's any kind of violence. You never really believe he'd kill Jim. Mm -hmm. Whereas Treasure Island, there's like, yeah, he'd prefer not to kill Jim, but he will. Like, if that's the only thing all the way to the very end, the end is that sort of, of the 1950 movie, is... There's a couple of points where you believe he's going to kill Jim if he has to. And the end is kind of where he finally makes the decision of, I, I need to kill Jim to escape, but I'm not. And how murderous, how cold Silver is, how honest is his affection, if he's kind of bonding with the PCs, how much of that is he's actually starting to like them, or how much of it is he's manipulating them and will kill them with a drop of a hat. Mm-hmm. The other big slider that we have, and this kind of goes along with the violence, is how historically accurate your pirates are, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> to, to kind of shift into aging up. Yeah, yeah. I believe that's that's kind of it with our aging down, right? So. Yeah, or even just in, in terms of Silver, who does he murder? Like, mm-hmm. in, in Treasure Planet, he doesn't murder anyone. He's mad when Scroop kills Mr. Arrow. And in mm-hmm. Treasure Island and in the 1950 movie, he kills Mr. Arrow. So. Uh-huh. Again, if you want to have him be a redeemable villain, or if your kids really love Treasure Planet, then, then yeah, having it be that he's not actively killing anybody is a good way to age it down. You know, conversely, if they just want to be fighting pirates, this is, this is a thing with kids where it really depends on how you want to paint Silver, how much you have them trust Silver to begin with before he turns out to be a villain, is going to affect how sympathetic you make him. Because if you have it be clear from the get-go, he's a pirate, he's a murderer, or if you have it be that, you know, he's really more kind of manipulating other people, but the PCs can see right through him, Mm -hmm. um, then you can just have him be flat-out villainous, you can have him be, you know, the evil Dark Lord, and the PCs are going to have a great time killing him. But if you're going to have him be, you know, having the, the PCs much more fill this Jim Hawkins role, having them come to care about him, having him think that he cares about them, don't make kids. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't, don't have this, this NPC that they really love turn out to be this vicious murderer who's just using them. So really, it's going to depend on what role you want Silver to play in your story. If you want him to be a villain, just have him be a villain. If you want him to be more sympathetic and ambiguous, then really soft pedal him. Really, like, do Treasure Planet at the baseline. Mm -hmm. If that is what your kids will most enjoy, if they're, as Rachel said, really bonding with Silver as an NPC, Mm -hmm. do them Treasure Planet. Yeah. And then for aging up, I don't think we're going to have to do a content warning here. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, you can do some extremely content warning necessary things if you're having realistic pirates, but we're not going to be getting into details of that. Yeah, so with aging up, that's that's going to be a big thing, is how historically accurate your pirates are going to be. They're not going to be, you know, Treasure Planet pirates, possibly not even Pirates of the Caribbean pirates. Original Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. pirates. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. And again, that's uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff with the sort of violence that pirates enjoy that you're really going to need to session zero with your players, depending on that. Like, there is the threat of torture 
in the book of Treasure Island, Jim is threatened with torture. Is that something that your players are okay with? Is that something you're going to be bringing in? Historical pirates did every possible triggering thing you can imagine. Yeah, right. So just, you know, make sure your session's heroing everything with your players. Pirates of the Caribbean, the movie, mm-hmm. not the ride, especially not the original ride. <laughs> Is I think going to be a good baseline mm-hmm. because they managed to have these very villain. Uh, the original, I not I don't remember much about the others, but the original they have these very villainous pirates. They're cutthroat. They're brutal. They're murderous. They're bandits, but they try and do it in kind of the f- most fun way possible. Mm-hmm. And there's a little bit of yar har har uh, saber rattling at Elizabeth, but it's very fun. Yes, it's 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 a fun theme park thrill ride. That is even aging up. That kind of be my limit mm-hmm. in terms of what I do with the pirates. Yeah, would be same. original Pirates of the Caribbean, the movie. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, your table, your decision on what kind of horror you want to do. But that is one way to do the aging up. Having them be violent, having them be ruthless. You can much more have Silver be faking his affection, dropping it at the turn of a dime. There's a bit in the book where, you know, he... he <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're about to do. Mm-hmm. He gave Jim the speech, right? It wasn't, it wasn't exactly the same as the movie speech, but he basically gave Jim the, you know, you've got you've got the mark of greatness and you've got to chart your own course, etc., etc., etc. And when Jim is, like, hiding in the barrel and overhearing something, the thing that he overhears is Silver is trying to flip one of the other sailors who isn't a pirate. <laughs> and... Silver's talking to this this sailor who's not a pirate yet, and he starts telling him, oh, yeah, you've got the mark of greatness on you, but you've got to chart your own course. Right, like, if they'd done that in Treasure Planet the movie, that would be, like, unforgivable. Yes. That would be the, this guy's just the villain of the story. Mm-hmm. So you can absolutely just have him be that level of just cold, manipulative sociopath. And... Again, we see him murdering people on screen. He's going around trying to recruit people, and if they don't join up with him, he just flat out kills them. Yeah, yeah. So you can have him be just, you know, once again, you know, using Pirates of the Caribbean as a baseline, you can see Barbosa doing that. Right. Not the manipulative part. He's not as smooth as Long John Silver. Mm-hmm. But absolutely, you know, he kills people on screen. The other thing we like to do in Dread Possibilities is any kind of AUs that we have. And one of the a- AUs that we have is taking from the original Sea of Sorrows. In the new Sea of Sorrows, Pietra von Ries, she's a pirate, and you know, you do have this, you know, it's a, this constantly shifting land. The original Sea of Sorrows uh, was uh, Peter von Ries, and instead of being a pirate, he was kind of more of a John Franklin figure looking for the Northwest Passage, and he was brutally murdering all of his men, because clearly it was their fault he hadn't found the Northwest Passage. And so part of his curse was that he was constantly trying to chart the Sea of Sorrows, much like somebody constantly trying to find a treasure, but the islands were always moving. And that was a thing with the Sea of Sorrows, even for the PCs, and kind of part of the horror of the Sea of Sorrows, was that you could never really chart it accurately. Like, if you stick right by the coastline, then you can, you know, sail down from Lamordia to Damon Lu and not have too much trouble. But as soon as you go out into the open waters, then it's going to be a problem for you. And we didn't do that for treasure planet because we wanted there to be this idea of commerce Mm -hmm. and of interaction between the islands and if the islands never know where the other ones are at any time yeah that doesn't work but if you want to do that and really play up that everyone's lost not just silver that's kind of a, a theme of the domain and a way that the domain is reflecting the dark lord and his curse that sounds great. That would be cool. Mm-hmm. So you could have it be that these these islands are constantly shifting around. You never know where anything is at any time. And so you really need something that's sort of a magic compass like the uh, right. scientific doodad that they get. Like the like, puzzle box yeah. thing. So that's that's one possibility for if you want to do kind of an AU treasure planet. I would If I were doing that, it would be really just coming in, getting on the legacy, doing the Journey to Treasure Planet story. That's not, as Rachel mentioned, really a setting for, like, a lot of other piracy stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not a setting that you can then kind of almost use as a sandbox to do whatever nautical, piratical adventures you want with. Because so much of sailing, trade, and piracy 
things have to be where you left them. Mm -hmm. Like, England has to be in the same direction that it was last week. Yeah, that might even be why Van Rees in the original was uh, a navigator rather than a pirate. Like, not only because this is the worst possible curse for a navigator, but how the heck are you going to do piracy if right, everything's yeah, moving yeah. all the time? <laughs> Hope you uh, find a ship, I guess. <laughs> So, we have given you a couple of things that could bring you to Flint's Archipelago. We've given you a couple of things you could do in Flint's Archipelago. And let's have our final thoughts, our parting thoughts about Flint's Archipelago in a section that we like to call... Parting Thoughts. So the first section of Parting Thoughts, we talk about the genres of horror, and this is actually the hardest genres of horror we've had, I think. Yes. And that's because a lot of the other domains, the kind of menace, the kind of threat, the kind of fear, the kind of edge to the domain is already there, Mm -hmm. and we're just accentuating it. This is one that is really a two-fisted adventure story. So there's nothing like the equivalent of Maleficent turning into a dragon Mm -hmm. or the gnolls eating people or even the Beast Castle. Like there's no like spooky kind of chill down the spine moment in this particular Disney movie. It's really just adventure. The closest thing we have is Scroop. He's pretty creepy and I do love Scroop. But then, you know, he dies two thirds of the way through the movie. So then we we don't have our creepy spider guy anymore. So, with genres of horror, you could really facilitate any genre of horror, because you could make a kind of pirate nautical Mm -hmm. story with any genre of horror. You could do slasher horror with a kind of Moby Dick, where some, like, monster is stalking a ship, or the ship has some kind of monster, kind of a Dracula in in the hold, you know, stalking people, taking out the crew one by one every night. You could do... A disaster horror, if there's a big tsunami, there's a big disaster, you come up with this ruin, you know, sunken city of Atlantis type deal. You could do cosmic horror, you know, there's plenty of Lovecraft stories mm-hmm. that are all about islands or temples or big squiddy things under the sea. So mm-hmm. part of the reason we can't nail down a genre of horror is... This is a setting that can accommodate itself to any genre of horror. Yeah. And I think for kind of the story we have, right. the closest things that... I, I would say the closest ones we'd have are ghost story, which was why we put those ghosts in in the first place so that we would have a genre Right, of yeah, horror. yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, when we're hammering up the story, I was like, Tom, we need a genre we need of ghosts. horror. Let's have some ghosts. <laughs> and you can, since we're playing up the guilt, mm-hmm. that Silver's guilt and Silver being haunted by his past and haunted by his mistakes and his sins, ghosts are a great choice. Thank you, Rachel. And awesome. yeah, so ghost story is the most obvious, and we had to put that in. We had to put in ghosts mm-hmm. to get ghost story. But once you add ghosts, it makes a good ghost story. It does. Psychological horror also works because right, yeah. it is kind of the manipulation and the betrayals and the everyone turning on everyone else. Like, if you if you think of this as being, you know, with, with Pirates of the Caribbean, especially in the later movies, there are all the double crosses that yeah, you, yeah. you can't keep track of who's double crossing and triple crossing whom anymore. And if that were happening, but there was always the risk that you were actually right. going to die. It wasn't just a fun romp. Yeah, when it when it turned out that, you know, Jack Sparrow's actually doing a triple cross, and now you're dead. I, I misspoke. There is one moment of edge, and that gives us our psychological horror. Mm-hmm. And that is the scene where Jim sees the pirates mm. talking quietly, mm-hmm. and they look up, and then they see him watching them, and then they stop talking. Like, yeah. there's... That, that's a a little bit of a chill. That's a little bit of a that's a little bit of an edge there, and that's psychological horror. Yeah, and also the scene where Silver comes down and sees that Jim is overheard. Yes, 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 yes. Which is, I think I've mentioned, my favorite scene in the movie. And if you're going to get horror out of that scene, it's going to be psychological horror. Mm-hmm. So our genre is going to be psychological horror and anything else. You want. <laughs> and we grabbed and it on other, a ghost yeah. story. <laughs> So in the write-up, it's going to be psychological horror and ghost story, but really, it's it's wide open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Put in a Cthulhu. Because Captain Flint is an illithid, so, or mm-hmm. was an illithid. So if you really want to dig into that, and you're super into the, all, the, all the scary illithid stuff and Spelljammer, and you really yeah, want to, yeah. oh, his, as his Nautilus ship is bopping around, it's leaving behind all this, you know, horrific illithid nonsense. Mm-hmm. That sounds awesome. Yeah, right. <laughs> also, you'd have much more of a cosmic horror game. So... With great effort, 
pulled out the genre of horror for the story, especially the genre of horror for kind of our core Treasure Planet, Treasure Island, being on the legacy with Long John Silver story. We talk about what kind of game you run. Is this one of those settings that could be a whole campaign with a million plot hooks like, you know, Barovia and Curse of Strahd? Is this one of those campaigns that's like one story? And once again, this is a shift. The last couple have been really like there's one mm-hmm. real story you do. This is, I think, since The Lion King, the most wide open sandbox setting. Yeah. Had. This is, maybe even more so than Lion King, because mm-hmm. this is, once again, just a framework where you can run any kind of pirate story you want. And it's very easy to connect that pirate story into plot or thematic elements of Treasure Island. I don't remember which episode it was where I mentioned that in a lot of my games, I don't even use the Dark Lords because they tend to eat up all the oxygen Mm -hmm. in the room. And I think this is the first one that we've done where you could have a whole bunch of fun nautical adventures in Flint's Archipelago and never run into silver. Right, right. You could adapt stories from Ghosts of Saltmarsh, adventures from Ghosts of Saltmarsh. You could do old adventures. You could take old pirate movies. You could do whatever you want, and it fits. And there's kind of a meta level here because Treasure Island really is one of the keystones of the pirate adventure story genre. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you could take almost any pirate story you want to do, or even like nautical adventure you want to do, and have it in the setting of Treasure Island, and it's like, yeah, that fits. Yeah. Just as a piece of literary criticism. Mm -hmm. We're, we're hoping to eventually do a domain of Pirates of the Caribbean because Barbosa is an obvious Dark Lord. Right, yeah. But, you know, if you wanted to just not worry about that right. and put Pirates of the Caribbean in Flint's Archipelago, again, that works great, too. You know, Barbosa was originally in Flint's crew and then, like, split yeah, off yeah. and did his own thing. <laughs> like, that... You, yeah. Any any pirate you want, you can you can connect to Long John Silver. They're even in Peter Pan. There are very strong implications that Hook served on Flint's ship. Yeah, I mean, so. it, no, it says like it says it, it, says, it, says, it, it says, flat oh, out yeah. says that. Yeah, he there's a line where he's trying to psych himself up, mm-hmm. and he says barbecue. Who's Long John Silver? If you didn't know, barbecue's the only man that Flint feared, and barbecue feared me. Mm. So no, like I, absolutely, I, know, I know they knew each other. I, I, know that I believe okay, there's cool. another line where they even say that he served on Flint. Nice. Ship. Yeah, that he was one of Flint's crew. That he knew Long John Silver. Mm-hmm. That yeah, we have a canonical Peter Pan connection. <laughs> and like we mentioned before, you can even you, you can ha- this is one of nice one where you can have the Dark Lord as part of the story, but he can just be like your fence. He can mm-hmm. just be like. The guy giving you jobs. Yeah. Or the guy who, like, he, he's he got his finger in every pie, so you need to find this ship. So you go to him, and he's really charming, and you have to owe him a favor, have to pay him, or do a job for him. And he gives you the information. So you can even engage with that that Dark Lord, but it doesn't need to be in an antagonistic way. Because mm-hmm. you can just be part of, be hooking into this criminal network that he manages. And speaking of other pirate stories that you can do, we've mentioned a couple times one of our big pirates in Ravenloft in 5e is Pietro Van Rees, mm-hmm. and we do have uh, Drag Assault Light around the old stuff, so we've always got our pirate Dark Lord. Bingo. <laughs> so let's talk about, as we always do, how to incorporate Treasure Planet into a wider Ravenloft core if you want to have kind of playing with a core like you did in third edition or even just have it connect to some of these you know floating mist islands that we have in fifth edition so one way to do it we mentioned that the sea of sorrows connects to every body of water in ravenloft in 5e and that would include flint's archipelago so Mm -hmm. you could very easily have it be you know you're sailing through flint's archipelago and then suddenly you're in the sea of sorrows and you could do anything with you know, your you sail to one of those islands and have you know adventures on Blaustein or whatever, and then either go back to Flint's Archipelago or that's your segue into the next you know non piratical leg of your campaign. You wouldn't be able to take John Silver with you, like you wouldn't be able right. to be on his ship when this happened because he can't leave. But if you were on a ship without the Dark Lord, then you can go to Sea of Sorrows. You could have it be that Flint's Archipelago follows Sea of Sorrows rules. You could have it just be that every sea in Ravenloft follows these rules. And so you're, you know, diddy bopping around the archipelago having adventures, and then suddenly you land a Calicari. You can mm-hmm. do that too if you wanted to. With the Sea of Sorrows as uh, written up in the 5e book, it's very much just like a cursed sea of horror islands. Mm-hmm. And that is also the archipelago, but the archipelago is also, like, trade yeah. and farms <laughs> and mines and factories and, like, people and having ports. So I think they could complement each other very well. Yeah. That the archipelago actually makes a better sort of 
home base for a nautical game, and then going into the Sea of Sorrows for going into the cursed, blasted, twisted islands. Oh, there are totally ghost stories about the Sea of Sorrows Ooh, all throughout the archipelago, yeah. about how sailors at night, they'll be like sailing along and the mist will come up and they'll be in this horrible dead ocean mm. with the zombie pirates, or that they'll, you know, they see a lighthouse and they follow the lighthouse, but it's the, you know, the evil witch light lighthouse is drawing them into the Sea of Sorrows. Mm -hmm. It's, it's to oh man, that's It's cool. like a ghost story, yeah. yeah that's that's that yeah. For <laughs> the Sea of Sorrows is Ravenloft to this Ravenloft domain. Right, right, right. <laughs> Except they have, they have a chance of eventually getting out and getting back into the archipelago because it's still Ravenloft. This also could be a good place because it's a nautical thing to bring in some Spelljammer monsters. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's very easy to reskin Spelljammer monsters and just have them be nautical. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of cool, spooky things in the Black Void. There are like giant monsters and brain eaters and vampires that drain your life energy. And Spelljammer mm -hmm. is just like us nautical sailing ships in space. <laughs> then Which is Treasure Planet. Exactly, right? It's all <laughs> coming together. So if you got Spelljammer like me then that's another source you have to draw on that particular style of horror that a lot of the monsters there evoke. Mm -hmm. And then this is a good place to do that in Ravenloft. And once again, since we're kind of doing this as the Spelljammer domain, yes. that we are going to say that it was Spelljammer originally as the Nautilus ship, all this stuff, that, that actually would be a way to give it a specific horror flavor, would be to be delving into the, uh, the more horror-like monsters of Spelljammer mm -hmm. and have that kind of be the consistent feel of it. So, strength and challenges are sort of final thing I like to talk about. I like this a lot. I'm pretty much all strength. Um, <laughs> as you might be able to tell by the fact that I'm really enthusiastic about this, and I sort of made Rachel do it. <laughs> I like nautical horror. Right, just, yes. You know, Tre Treasure Planet was not a part of my childhood, and reading Treasure Island felt a lot more like yeah. homework than reading Peter Pan did. <laughs> <laughs> so, in my notes, I say, Pirates! Exclamation point. Spooky! Exclamation point. <laughs> just, I love the concept of nautical horror. And this is a thing, like, kind of coming out, and one of the reasons I'm really proud of this domain and this sort of write-up is nautical horror is kind of underdeveloped in Ravenloft. Mm -hmm. Like, you have the Sea of Sorrows, but it's very, like, B-tier mm -hmm. at best a domain. This is not a, like, Barovia or a Darkon or a... Any of the ones people have heard of. This is this is this is honestly B, B tiers. B tier is far too generous. It's C tier at best. Mm -hmm. And nautical horror is one of the classic subgenres. This is a thing that's very much in that canon that so many of those famous Ravenloft domains are drawing from. So honestly, thinking about it, it's a little surprising there isn't a more like well established, well fleshed out A B tier ghost pirate domain. Mm -hmm. So if we can give you that, dear listener, then I think we have done a valuable service. And putting on my Ravenloft Grognard hat for a minute, I was looking over the Oceanic domains for our incorporating section because, yeah, they are really the C-tier domains and they, these were never any of my favorites. I couldn't remember very much about them. They're, they're no Borka. I know Borka is a C-tier domain for everyone but me and hey, I don't care. It's mine. So one of the problems is that, like, with the Sea of Sorrows, again, kind of the problem we were talking about with the shifting islands, you don't get kind of that sense of, uh, like, golden age of piracy, all of the all of these islands living in terror of pirates are just kind of your go-to experience there. And with the Nocturnal Sea, then you've got the Dark Lord there is Meridoth, and Meridoth is pretty cool, but he's a necromancer. And he's just kind of a necromancer who happens to be the Dark Lord of an ocean domain. It's, it's not, he's not really thematically linked to the ocean. You know, he, he has this island in the Nocturnal Sea that's his base of operations. And he does all of his necromancer stuff there. But he, you know, he's not like a pirate or an evil tyrannical ship captain or anything like that. And, you know, Saragoss is cool. If you're not into the older stuff, Saragoss is kind of, it's the Sargasso Sea, as you can guess from the name. So mm -hmm. it is just, you sail in there and you're just trapped in this floating, you know, detritus, constantly becalmed, struggling to make your way out, like going from ship to ship, just like raiding all of the other ships, stealing their supplies, probably turning to cannibalism, mm -hmm. and just all, all kinds of amazing, cool things happening in Saragoss. But again, doesn't give you that, you're, performing piracy on these other ships, but you're not getting that, like, golden age of piracy, we're gonna go attack Aruba kind of, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of vibe. 
Krognard head off. <laughs> yeah, Krognard head off. So that that is a good transition into the challenges. Uh, mm-hmm. And the biggest challenge, as we something we touched on, which is that the core story does not have nearly as much of an edge, nearly as much of a shadow as a lot of the other stories we've mm-hmm. looked at. So it's, it's but we had to put the horror in. Mm-hmm. We had to take this story. It has a psychological component of Silver's guilt and obsession. But in terms of making this a horror setting, we had to put all that in there. Treasure Island is a classic adventure story. It's not a spooky story. Mm-hmm. And even the darker shadows to it. You know, Peter Pan isn't a horror story either. But the shadows are so dark. Mm-hmm. And there aren't really dark shadows to Treasure Island beyond pirates. Sure were bad. Yeah, they sure were. <laughs> and nobody wants to have the domain where the horror is pirates being awful. <laughs> so we can give you a lot of setting and a lot of aesthetics and theme, piracy, but you're going to have to put the horror in yourself. There's The horror is less inherent to the domain, and that can be good, that can be bad, but that is work you have to do if you want to have nautical piratical adventures with your Ravenloft PCs. Yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much all that we have to say about mm-hmm. Treasure Planet. But we may have some more to say about Treasure Planet. Yes, we are. Hopefully later in the month. Yes, F- fingers crossed. Because this is this we are really excited about. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If you want the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup experience with Ravenloft and Spelljammer, uh-huh. then stay tuned. So before we rejoin our narrator and find out where she's going next, which is not anywhere in a spaceship, <laughs> sadly, just a regular boring old boat. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about how you can reach out and get in touch with us if you have some ideas about the genre of horror that best fits Treasure Planet or anything else. Well, you can email us at wonderfulworldofdarklords at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook at Wonderful World of Dark Lords and on Twitter, where we're probably the most active because that's where the Dark Lords are, both literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wonderful World of Dark Lords is too long. Wonderful Dark Lords is also too long. So we are on Twitter at Wonder Dark Lords. This is Future Rachel, and boy howdy, has the social media landscape changed since we recorded this back in September. We are still on Twitter at Wonder Dark Lords. We are planning on being there until they turn the lights off, which may be sooner rather than later, because apparently the security team was non-essential staff. That is no longer where the Dark Lords are, other than the obvious one. They've all migrated over to Tumblr, so we are also on Tumblr now at Wonderful World of Dark Lords. So you can find us, Wonderful World of Dark Lords at gmail.com, Facebook and Tumblr, Wonderful World of Dark Lords, Twitter at Wonder Dark Lords. If you have been interested in checking out Azalyn's writing or looking for some of Haylight's art, they were both primarily on Twitter before. Our show notes links went to their Twitter accounts. Azalyn went over to Tumblr and the Great Dark Lord migration, so you can find Azalyn on Tumblr now rather than Twitter. And Haylight now has art accounts on Tumblr and Instagram rather than Twitter. Those will be linked in the show notes as well. What a time to be alive. In positive update news, we were mentioning that we were hoping to get some kind of bonus material out to you involving Ravenloft Spelljammer. We did get that completed, so look for that on December 20th. We're going to be dropping that in one week. All right, back to blissful September, Tom and Rachel. If you like how we've adapted this, which was a little bit of a challenge, especially taking the whole spaceship thing into consideration, then I've adapted a couple other horror movies, most of which by John Carpenter, into D&D Adventures. And those are available if you just see, like, more by this author. If you go to the write-up for this domain on DMs Guild, you'll see it there. If you search for Tom Kohler, you'll see it there. If you like how we adapted it to doing with younger players, we do have a lot of very good advice about horror stuff, resources for horror gaming with younger players, running nice, fun, Halloween, spooky stuff that's not going to hopefully traumatize anyone, (laughs) which will also be there if you just search for Tom Kohler on DMs Guild. You'll find that as well. And then speaking of horror for younger people, I have a picture book called Mother Ghost Nursery Rhymes for Little Monsters, which is exactly what it sounds like. And then I also have some horror stories for adult readers, which you can find links to on my website, www.rachelkohler.com. I don't think any of them have pirates in them, sadly. I need to go fix that. Get on that, honey. Yeah. (laughs) Until next time, thank you for listening, and happy gaming. parting thoughts. I had thought Flint's treasure a ghost story at first, but having encountered an actual ghost, to say nothing of the backstabbing and skullduggery the horde engendered, I now believe otherwise. 
Silver is a clever man, and his wisest course of action would have been to tell me the truth of their mission from the start, then kill me once we found it. I can think of only two reasons for the deception. Either Silver is the sort that loves to lie so much that it comes more naturally than the truth, or the treasure is cursed in some way, leading seekers to sabotage or betray one another. Perhaps Flint's malevolent spirit is still protecting his trove from any who might wrest it from his grasp, and those who fail return as ghosts to haunt new treasure seekers. Of course, I have no doubt that my patron can imagine a cornucopia of other reasons why one might lie about one's true intentions for no apparent purpose, and I eagerly await his insight on the matter. Although I feared Silver's ship would overtake me, I rode my skiff into the mists without incident. Clutching my rose mist talisman in my hand, I peered through the swirling mists, looking for a glimpse of something there that wasn't there before. Regards, D. My petulant servant, your indignation is quite apparent in this bereft report. My methods, just as my name, are earned and not freely given. However, you may rest assured I am fully cognizant of your undying devotion to your family. They, as you, are under my protection as long as my little scholar remains in my charge. Once again, you have let your nerves hinder your abilities to thoroughly research the situation at hand. I have gifted you with the means to protect yourself, and you should rely upon them. For now, we must speculate on what Flint's treasure holds and why Silver's obsessed with obtaining it for his own. I suspect your cursed treasure theory may be close to the truth, but for now it shall remain as buried as Captain Nathaniel's treasure hoard. This has been The Wonderful World of Dark Lords. We have no affiliation with Disney or Wizards of the Coast. All music recordings used in this episode are in the public domain and are available through museopen.org. Links are in the show notes. Dialogue for Yensid was written by Azalyn Rex himself, who you can find on Tumblr at Dark Lord Azalyn. The Wonderful World of Dark Lords logo was designed by Haylight Jones. Links to their work are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. And I'm not going to talk about Captain Hook going to Eaton. Um, <laughs> but Captain Hook did go to Eaton, and that's the main reason that we didn't have him be Peter Pan's brother. Hi, right. Pierre of Hunts. Yeah, yeah. That was a great idea, but that's yeah, why yeah. we didn't do it. <laughs> okay, this is going to be the stinger. Um, Dressed to you directly. Yes. So, uh, in the play, Captain Hook's final words are the motto of Eaton. And... There's actually in that the next bit where it's the whole oh barbecue you know Flint the only man Flint feared was barbecue and I'm the only man barbecue feared his sort of like self doubt says oh and what house were they in like <laughs> so there you go bear there. off you're because, a singer hi <laughs> because Captain Captain because Captain Hook went to Eaton. <laughs>